I am Susan Chapman, uh, faculty in the School of Nursing and happy to moderate our talk this evening. Um, our speaker is Dr. Joanne Spetz. Uh, Joanne Spetz is director and Brenda and Jeffrey Kang, presidential chair in healthcare finance at the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies at the University of California, San Francisco. Her research focuses on the economics of the healthcare workforce, the organization of healthcare services, and the quality of healthcare. Uh, she directs the federally funded UCSF Health Workforce Research Center on Long-Term Care, which generates evidence to ensure that we have an adequate workforce to provide patient-centered care to individuals with long-term care needs across the whole lifespan. She is an internationally known expert on the nursing workforce, leading studies of nursing supply, demand, education, earnings, and contributions to the quality of healthcare across settings. Dr. Spetz is an honorary fellow of the American Academy of Nursing. She received her PhD in economics from Stanford University after studying economics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So we welcome her um, and um, I'm sure you'll enjoy this talk, which is health workforce shortages in the wake of the pandemic. What can policy and practice leaders do to resolve the crisis? And I will uh, rejoin you later for the Q&A portion of this session. Thank you, Susan. And I should note that Susan is the co-director of our Long-Term Care Workforce Center. Um, and we've been colleagues and collaborators for quite a long time. You know, there have been all kinds of reports. I'm sure many of you have seen headlines, um, these specific ones or ones similar to this, that focus on the kinds of issues with burnout, um, the great resignation, which also is hitting healthcare workers and um, concerns about what is going to happen with potential shortages of healthcare professionals into the future. So I wanna put these issues into a broader context. Um, you know, our healthcare system in the United States has a number of challenges and the health workforce is a really key component to addressing all of these issues. We have fragmentation across our system. We have multiple insurance providers, delivery systems, um, different components of the workforce, different settings, electronic health records that don't always communicate with each other, which Dr. Adler Milstein and her colleagues talked about a few weeks ago. And these, all th these things all um, intertwine with the other issues on this slide. We have significant healthcare disparities in the United States by geography, by income, by race, ethnicity, by age, um, and so on. We have an aging population as well as a sicker population. Those are both distinct things and overlapping things. We have ongoing primary care shortages, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. And we also have really high costs of care in the US. Um, we have the most expensive healthcare system in the world and we do not have the best health outcomes in the world. So these issues all have uh, significant negative impacts that really get closer into the health workforce. There's a lack of integration among providers because we have such a divided system. Healthcare providers also are thus um, you know, somewhat divided as well. Um, our system tends to reward volume of care and not the value of care or the quality of care. And that creates some perverse incentives that I'll talk about a little bit that, that are now playing out with some of the issues around where we go in the future. And you know, the net impact of all of this is lower quality care and very high costs of care. So just with that context, um, you know, prior to the pandemic, there was a lot of activity. The main purpose of this whole session would have been to talk about integration and coordination of services and some of the advancements happening and how it's all moving too slowly. Um, Patient-centered medical homes that bring together clinicians to help take care of people, accountable care organizations from Medicare that provide, again, incentives for providers to come together and ensure that a whole person's care needs are met. Um, population health focused initiatives, and then greater integration of electronic health records so that information can be shared in ways that protect the privacy of individuals, but really help to optimize the care that's provided. 
to achieve all of that, we already knew prior to the pandemic that we needed a workforce to improve access outcomes and costs, and that we were facing increasing demand for health services with the rising in, um, income inequality, and many Californians specifically lack primary care access. Um, we also know that the Affordable Care Act did increase affordability for some people, and California has been a leader in expanding health insurance through the Affordable Care Act, but not everybody is covered yet. Um, we also knew that we had high turnover rates in a lot of health professions and occupations, especially what a lot of us call frontline jobs, jobs that are patient facing that work with individuals in their homes, in hospitals and clinics and other settings. And that we have shortages of healthcare workers, but I'll point out that those are not everywhere and it's not all professions. So what I'm gonna discuss tonight, um, and I'm not gonna belabor this too much because I really wanna hear your, Q and, your questions and have time for the Q and A. Um, I'm going to talk about what the healthcare workforce is because there are, um, we, I think when you see the numbers, you'll have a broader appreciation for all of the different kinds of individuals that contribute to our system. What kinds of jobs, where they work, what's in their education, what are their demographics. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about what we know about the pandemic effects on healthcare employment. Um, a lot of that is coming from research from our colleagues up at University of Washington. Um, and I'll present some of their recently published work. Then I'll talk a little bit about what was happening with healthcare workforce shortages before the pandemic. And I'm gonna really do that through the lens of physicians and primary care and um, nursing. And then I'll discuss some of what we have learned about the nursing workforce and what's been happening during the pandemic, because um, that's one of my areas of expertise. And I think it's emblematic of what's happening across all the healthcare occupations. And then I'll talk about some of the solutions that have been proposed, uh, many of which are not new and um, have actually, I'll talk a little bit about the California Future Health Workforce Commission that pre-pandemic put forward a blueprint for our future. And I think really their recommendations still stand as relevant and valuable. So let's start with the occupations in the healthcare industry. So this pie chart gives you information about the different occupations that we have in healthcare. And um, I want you to notice a few things here. Um, and I believe I've got some boxes that are gonna highlight. The first is notice that physicians are less than 4% of the occupations of the employment in the healthcare industry. Um, they have an outsized role in our healthcare system relative to the numbers that they have in our healthcare system. And that's really important to just remember that there are many, many other occupations that are important for generating your health and for supporting your health and for supporting our entire population's health. The next thing I want you to notice is that a lot of employment, about a quarter of it, is in what we call the healthcare support occupations. These are basically all the jobs that have the word assistant or aid in them, nursing assistants, home health aides, dental assistants, physical therapy assistants, and so on. So there are many, many more people in those jobs than physicians. The third thing I want you to notice is the non-direct care occupations. So um, oddly, the year that these data are from, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, home and personal care aides were being classified as non-direct care occupations. But in truth, I mean, that group should probably be put over into the um, healthcare support occupations. And in the newer data, they did make that change. Um, but this also includes community health workers, social workers, everybody who's doing administrative roles. It includes grounds, maintenance, food preparation, which in any of the healthcare sectors that involve bricks and mortar and delivery of services within a facility, those actually are a big share of the employment. Um, so, so this um, gives you a sense about some of the different employment categories that we're talking about. So, we wanna consider all of these workers. And if we then break these data down into the sectors of the healthcare industry, I, it's probably not surprising to anybody here that hospitals are the biggest share and that offices of physician are the second biggest. Um, and then you have a pretty even split between residential and continuing care, nursing care facilities, home health services, and other ambulatory care. So hospitals are um, really, you know, not quite half, but pretty close to it. 
And then you've got, um, you know, you've got it kind of spread pretty evenly across the different delivery um, sectors of our healthcare industry. So let's, let's tab a little bit more. So who's working where? Um, and this is pertinent for just understanding employment patterns and what you might hear about the workforce. Um, registered nurses dominantly work in hospitals and um, that and a fair proportion of physicians work in primarily in hospitals. And those are really the only two occupations in which kind of the lion's share of their employment or even a substantial wedge of it is in hospitals. Physical therapists have a reasonable level of employment in hospitals, but most of them are in ambulatory care. Most physicians are in ambulatory care. Also notice a lot of nurses are in ambulatory care. That's that pink wedge, that pink part of the bar there. Um, there are actually more nurses working in ambulatory care than there are physicians. But look at the second and third bars there. Those are your personal care aides and your home health aides. Um, they work across a lot of different settings, ambulatory care, nursing residential and home health care. Um, and then that green bar is other health and social services. And the gray is all other, which for personal care aides is mostly working in the home. And so personal care aides are pretty spread out across a variety of different employment settings as are home health aides. Um, you also find even physicians spread out and some of them are working in other settings. And so for some of them, that includes their homes. It might include them working in um, the insurance industry or in the pharmaceutical industry or in other sectors. Um, and then social workers are primarily working in human services agencies. I also want you to notice that the second largest occupation here is personal care aides and the third largest is home health, home health aides. If we added them together, they would surpass registered nurses. So these um, personal care aides and home health aides are really together the largest health occupation in the United States. So now I wanna talk about the education that's required. The um, occupations that are in green are the occupations that do not require any post-secondary education and possibly for some of them don't even require a high school degree. So personal care aides, home health aides, and community health workers are generally high school graduates and their education and training is mostly on the job. Um, home health aides are certified. There is a post high school certification required, but um, otherwise these occupations are entry level occupations available to people straight out of high school. The professions in blue are your professions that are requiring at least an associate degree or some kind of formal post-secondary education. So that'd be registered nurses, that'd be your EMTs, your clergy. And then some of the, the occupations that are in um, purple require a master's degree. And then the pink ones are doctoral degrees. So notice that the, the occupations with the biggest employment are entry level. And even the registered nurses who in and of themselves are a very large number of employees, that, that licensure can be obtained with an associate degree. So it's also important for us to keep in mind that many, many people working in healthcare do not have a doctorate. And um, in fact, physicians as doctors are you know, less than 5%. And that there are many people with a wide range of education that are working in the industry. So um, now if we look at occupations with the highest projected change in employment, um, the, now some of these are not healthcare industries. Um, interestingly, the highest percentage chain projected when the Bureau of Labor Statistics did these projections was solar voltaic installers. And the second highest percentage wise was wind turbine service technicians. But of course, the numbers of employment in those are rather small, 6,100 and 3,800 each. Whereas in comparison, home health aides are you know, over 300,000 and they're looking at a 37% roughly increase in employment over 10 years. Personal care aides have almost exactly the same employment growth rate. And there's over 800, almost 900,000 people in those sectors. So the amount of job growth here is really um, quite stunning if you think about the future. And it also is really important to note that most of these jobs do not require a bachelor's degree to enter. So this is a you know, similar theme by industry. 
Um, the jobs that require less than a bachelor's degree are um, really across all the sectors of healthcare, but very concentrated in long-term care. But it's true for hospitals where, of course, registered nurses are dominant. Now, about over 60% of registered nurses do have a um, bachelor's or higher degree. So this is the minimum entry required, but probably you know, uh, of that 50% at the associate, de- where the associate degree is the minimum requirement, more than half of that group is going to be at the bachelor's or higher level. Um, but you do see in the home health care, long-term care sector, um, that you've got a lot of people where the jobs are high school or less. So many of these occupations are really um, racially and ethnically diverse. These are national data. If we looked at California data, they would show even more diversity. Um, So the pink bar is um, the percentage that is white. The orange bar is the percentage that is black or African-American. And the turquoise is Hispanic Latino. The green is Asian. And then the gray is other, um, which would include Native American, Native Alaskan, Native Hawaiian. Um, each of the each of the groups, when you get into those categories, is very is relatively small. So if you start breaking them all out, you you really don't have a lot of precision in the measurement. Um, so just notice that the personal care aides, the home health aides, the certified nursing assistants, um, are very diverse workforces in terms of the mix of racial and ethnic groups represented. But even among the licensed professions, the physicians, the registered nurses, these also are very diverse occupations. To look at this in a little more detail, these are data from our colleagues up at University of Washington, who I mentioned, um, and and this was a collaborative project that I did with them and somebody at um, University of Minnesota, where we were looking at the um, demographic and socioeconomic profile of healthcare workers by sector. And there are a few things to notice. First, for all industries, um, the gender balance is not quite 50-50, but pretty close and about 17% of the workforce um, overall in the United States was um, not born in the United States as a citizen. Um, Might have been born in the US, but as a non-citizen. If you look at the healthcare industry, the percent that was not born in the United States is a little bit lower than than the US as a whole, but much more female, many, many more women. If we want to look a little bit more deeply, we're back to home health services as having the highest proportion of women and the highest proportion not born as US citizens. So this, the long-term care workforce, which is dominated by individuals who do, who have lower levels of education, who are more, fe- more often female, more often immigrant, um, this workforce actually has a lot of financial risk. And this came again from our colleagues at University of Washington, who I think are the experts on this topic. Um, the left batch of bars is the percentage of workers who are earning less than $15 an hour. These data, I believe, are from 2015 or so. So we do know that there have been wage increases for many workers in this category. But um, even with these older data, you get a sense about a large proportion earning very low wages. The next batch of bars is the um, percent that are living at or below the poverty level. So 20% of people working in long-term care part-time are at or below the poverty level. The next batch is people who are uninsured. It really is stunning the number of people who work in healthcare who do not have health insurance. Um, Then you've got the next group is the group that received earned income tax credits which is a, um, actually, I think one of the really great and clever programs in the United States that provides a tax credit for people who have earned income, but have low income. Um, The next batch is the percent that are enrolled in Medicaid nationwide. And then the last batch is people who receive supplemental nutrition payments. And so you see that the long-term care workforce in particular Um, It has a lot of dependence on social services, has high risk of poverty, has low wages. And so we pay a lot of attention to this workforce because these are really important workers who who some people call low skilled. But if anybody has watched a really good home care aide take care of a family member, they know that these jobs often require a tremendous amount of skill in, in just ways that do not involve formal education. 
So this next table um, continues to reiterate this theme. Um, this is people who report that they are employed in the sector but are unemployed and, and at or below the poverty threshold. So overall in our economy, um, of all industries at any given time, you'll you'll find that um, possibly up, you know nine ten percent might say that they're currently unemployed, but they identify themselves as in the, in the um, workforce, and so they are seeking work. Um, and these data, again, I think these are um, this is from a slightly different paper. I think these data are probably from around two, 2013 or so. Um, and so that was still when we were coming out of the recession. So the unemployment rates for um, the U.S. were pretty high. And you've got about 10% of workers um, at or below the poverty level. So in the healthcare sector, you can see that um, the healthcare industries were doing a lot better in terms of unemployment rates and also doing better in terms of poverty rates. But um, again, that home health care services is pretty emblematic of returning to higher unemployment rates, higher poverty rates, actually double the poverty rate of the US as a whole for the workforce. And finally, those bottom ones um, also have, for nursing care facilities and residential, have higher unemployment rates than a lot of other healthcare um, sectors, but still are um, generally doing better on unemployment than the U.S. as a whole, but not doing better on poverty. So this is the this is looking at the turnover in these occupations. This is work that um, that I got to do. Actually, this is work that Bianca did on her own. Um, that she published that was looking at the industry that people worked in the year before they entered the healthcare industry. And then the year if they left, where did they go to? So the left set of columns is people who entered the healthcare industry um, over a 10 year period. And the most common source of entry was that they hadn't been in the labor force or they'd been unemployed and then they entered healthcare jobs. And when we dig down into this more, the jobs that they enter are typically those direct care jobs and the jobs that do not require formal education. And then you've got leisure and hospitality being another sector where a lot of people enter from and the retail trade spaces. Um, and some people enter also from educational services. Now, some of those might be faculty that um, like nursing school faculty that then move into being um, nurses in the industry. Um, and then you've got people who are in school. Um, the right is where do they go when they leave healthcare jobs? Over a third are out of the workforce. They still say that they, they're not retired yet but they're also not in the workforce. And then another nine, nearly 19% are unemployed. So they're looking for work actively, but they're not employed at the time. So when people leave healthcare jobs, um, they often are leaving for unemployment essentially. So um, this is a paper that focuses a little bit more on some of the lower, um, lower educated healthcare worker um, settings. And again, hospitality shows up as a big one, retail as another significant one, um, but also office administration jobs, education jobs, and so on. So what was, what's been going on with the pandemic? Let's talk about healthcare employment during the pandemic a little bit. This was also from our friends at University of Washington, where they did some really rapid assessments. This is the first quarter of the pandemic. And these are initial unemployment claims in the United States. Uh, no, these are um, actually from Washington State, because those were the most rapidly um, available data. And I think these are really no different than what we would see in any other state in the United States. Um, you had immediate rapid unemployment claims from dental assistants. Remember all the dentist offices closing? Dental assistants got laid off big time. Home health aides and personal care aides. Um, home health agencies stopped sending people into the home. And personal care aides, I mean, families often said, yeah, we don't want aides here. Um, and or aides said, I'm a little bit scared to go to work and filed for unemployment. Um, registered nurses, there were um, large numbers of claims for registered nurses. If they worked in ambulatory care settings, um, you know, all the clinics closed, physicians' offices closed, ambulatory care surgeries, um, you know, all of the routine ambulatory surgeries. If you were scheduled for a colonoscopy, you were canceled. All the nurses who work in that unit also were canceled and filed for unemployment. Um, and so you can see there was a lot of healthcare um, unemployment claims, even just in Washington state. And again, I think these numbers are very representative of the whole US. So let's um, 
talk about some more recent work. This is really truly hot off the press. This was published about three weeks ago um, by Bianca Frogner and Jeanette Dell. Jeanette's at the University of Minnesota. And they did some estimations, um, controlling for demographics and so on, of rates of healthcare, um, of turnover rates of healthcare workers leaving jobs or changing jobs um, by healthcare setting. So the left point is the pre-pandemic period. The middle point is what they called kind of the, the pandemic period part one, which would have been April through December, 2020. And then the right is kind of that pandemic part two, January to October, 2021. So, I mean, you might call it the, the pre-vaccination period and the post-vaccination period. So a few things to note here. Um, turnover rates in long-term care were high to begin with, over 4%, and they actually continued to rise throughout the full pandemic period. And that's a really interesting contrast to the other three sectors. Ambulatory care had a relatively low un um, turnover rate to begin with, uh, around 3%. And then during the pandemic, it jumped up to 6%, and then it dropped right back down, not quite to where it was before, but pretty close. Similarly, hospitals had a really low rate of turnover. It jumped up, and then it's returned pretty close to normal, and the same is true for other settings. So let's look at this by occupations. If we um, take, their, take a look at what they found for occupations, you see some big differences across different occupations. The top line is, is people with the aid and assistant job titles, dental assistant, physical therapy assistant, nursing assistant, home personal care assistant, et cetera. And you can see this big jump in turnover rates, essentially people quitting or being fired, and then um, not really any recovery, um, not much recovery in the turnover rate. So people are still quitting and leaving these jobs at a pretty brisk pace. Um, the next bar down, that next lighter gray bar is licensed um, practical and vocational nurses. And they have a very similar pattern, not a lot of recovery in those turnover rates. Even physicians down at the bottom who historically have very low turnover rates, their turnover rates have been increasing pretty continuously throughout this time period. So if we look at the next slide, they did a little bit of breakdown um, by gender and whether there are children um, ages uh, younger than five years old. So that orange line is women in the health professions with children younger than five years. And you can see that that was where the turnover rates were already the highest and they jumped up the most and they have recovered the least. Um, the blue line of men with children younger than five years old has a very similar pattern. The turnover rates are lower to begin with, but it has a very similar pattern as for women with children younger than five years. Um, women in general had higher turnover and less recovery um, than did men. And then these are the turnover rates um, by race ethnicity. And it's kind of a messy chart. So the things I'll point out is the topmost gray line is um, people of Asian descent. And that is a, you know, if people of Asian descent are spread across num a number of different health occupations. There are many in nursing, there are many in medicine, there are many in the home care occupations and other direct care work. Um, the blue line is um, Native American, um, Pacific Islanders, and Alaska Natives. Um, the blackish line that's right under that are people of, um, who are multiracial. And then you've um, got a, a line for black. And then you've got um, below that, the line for Latino and the lowest um, turnover rates to begin with. And, um, and some of the lesser change was white, although we see a lot of change there too. So these kinds of these turnover rates have been hitting um, pretty consistently across race, ethnicity, across gender, across occupation, and across industry. So let's talk a little bit about shortages and provide a pre-pandemic view of the shortage situation. These are all headlines from before the pandemic. You know, these are from mostly 2017 headlines. Um, and, you know, they're all about different um, issues with physician shortages, concerns about shortages, where it might be better or worse, and so on. And uh, pretty much over that same time period, we were seeing similar headlines coming out about nursing shortages. 
So this was a big issue um, hitting the headlines in 2018, 2019, even as early as 2016 and 17, we're seeing some headlines around this. So doesn't it seem like we always have shortages of physicians and nurses? And the answer is, yeah, it always seems like we do. But there are some reasons. I, I want you to have a skeptical eye on these stories. Interest groups have reasons to love to say that they have a shortage because it helps to generate more money for nursing and medical schools. It helps to generate higher pay. It draws attention to these issues and it can be beneficial for both the workers and for the schools um, that educate them as well as just for the industry as a whole. Um, you know, we, we know of times where hospitals have gone to insurance companies and said, we need to negotiate for higher payment rates because of the nursing shortage, we've had to raise our wages so much. So there's a lot of money in the shortage story. So, you know, I, I'm an economist. I tend to be cynical about these kinds of things. But at the same time, I think there is truth to concerns about shortages. We have an aging baby boomer population. We have smaller subsequent generations to take care of them. Or, you know, some people have quick, we have an awful lot of nurses retiring at the same time that all those nurses are going to need their knees replaced. Um, residency funding for medical residencies in the U.S. has have not increased for decades. It's a very flat amount of residency money that's out there. And um, immigration of doctors and nurses appears to have been dropping. And that was happening pre-pandemic. So these factors have all been a concern and a legitimate concern around shortages. We also, you know, we continuously hear that there are fewer healthcare workers, not just physicians and nurses, than are needed to deliver healthcare services. And that is a tricky term because what exactly we need is not a clearly defined number. Um, a lot of workers can do similar jobs and substitute for each other. Um, there are a lot of things that are borderline elective that could be delayed, could be deferred, that if they don't happen at all, it might not necessarily be a terrible outcome for an individual. And at the same time, we also know that, um, and we hear claims, that for some things, there might be too many health workers and we get too much care. There's a lot of discussion about too much prescribing, too many knee replacements, too, many, a very, too much imaging, too many MRIs too many exposures to radiation from screenings and so on. So there's a lot of debate about what we need, but beyond that numbers, I mean, we could spend forever in a rabbit hole talking about number we need, number we don't need, et cetera. Um, beyond that, I think there are other key workforce issues that are really critical. Geographic distribution being one of the key ones, um, primary care versus specialty care, the productivity and the ability of workers to do their best work and provide the a good amount of services and not really waste their time on unnecessary administrative and bureaucratic hurdles, the quality of care that's provided and the roles of integrating other healthcare providers. So to step back and look at the geography, shortages are not uniform across regions. So this map is from California. Um, it's a little, it's about a decade old. It was one of the newer maps that looked really pretty that I could find um, and, down, and download. Um, but you know, in general, about 20% of Californians live in an area that's designated as a health profession shortage area. Those would be essentially all of the areas that are um, orange or yellow. And for some of those, um, it is a, full geographic area and for, you know, like a whole county or close to a county. And for others, the shortage is associated with specific settings of care. So there might be a shortage, but only for um, community health centers or for certain populations. Um, but there's an awful lot of California's geography and a large proportion of our population. Um, and this really tells us that there are a lot of differences across the regions of California. Short, and this is true everywhere in the US. Shortages are not uniform. We also know with an aging population that this is um, going to hit crisis, propor crisis proportions. And this um, graphic is from the California Future Health Workforce Commission that did its work before the pandemic. And, um, and also, I think this issue was reflected in there being a um, commission on aging for California um, that was led by, the, that the governor put together and was led by many experts in California. 
So shortages have really significant costs to all of us. Um, we, we lose productivity. Um, instability in the workforce is not good for anybody. Um, you know, many of us may have worked at times in our lives or had friends who worked at organizations where there was just a lot of instability, turnover, people quitting, um, concerns about overwork and so on. And all of those stresses reduce productivity, reduce quality, et cetera. When organizations need to hire a lot of temporary staff, that's extra money, that's expensive. Recruitment is expensive. When beds and clinics are closed and patients are deferred, that can be costly both in health and in money. Overtime pay is expensive. Training and orientation is expensive. And when organizations are understaffed, we have patient safety failures. This is really well documented. When there's a shortage of nurses in, within any care setting, we end up with patient safety lapses. We end up with errors that could have been avoided. So a lot of way that people think about um, supply of health professionals is they assume that if we educate people, then they'll go and work in healthcare. And um, that this is just a, a linear progression. But this is really problematic because it ignores behavioral characteristics. Healthcare workers make decisions based on both the economic incentives that they face as well as their family circumstances, their family's needs, the other demands on their time, and so on. And these things are not related necessarily to the healthcare needs of the population. And conversely, employers, the demand side of the market, um, their demand responds to um, economic, social, insurance, healthcare needs, a whole bunch of other things. Um, but not all of those things are super tightly tied to the health needs of the population. So the classic thinking of, oh, we need this many, so if we train this many, we're going to get this many, doesn't really work. It makes it really complex to figure out how many we're going to have supplied to the healthcare industry and how many are really going to be demanded and get employed. So let's look a little more closely at physician workforce shortages to provide some examples of what I'm talking about. I'll start with the American Association of Medical Colleges. They publish supply and demand forecasts regularly. Um, these forecasts are a little bit old, but um, the general layout of these does not tend to change that much over time. The um, blue line here was their most plausible demand projection, and the green line was their most plausible supply projection. And they came out with this report and said, we have a shortage of nearly 160,000 physicians coming ahead. And these models are very sophisticated, but as I noted, there is a little bit of a um, economic incentive for this association to also want to say that there's a shortage looming because they want to get more money to support education. Um, when we look at different specialties, they also report these kinds of data by specialty. And you can see that they um, actually estimated, I, I think these are valid data, that primary care was um, going to have the biggest shortages over time. Um, other patient care areas would um, that are not specialties. Surgery, general surgery was projected to have significant shortages and those projections continue to exist. And, um, but the other medical specialties are not thought to have as much of a shortage. So, you know, there are some conflicting reports and we know that supply varies wildly across regions. And um, we also know that, to be honest, there is not that much broad evidence that more physicians in general produce better health outcomes in a community. Um, so in the past, expanded medical education has also generated more specialists, which raises questions about primary care and why we continue to have a shortage of primary care when there are people graduating but are choosing to not go into primary care. And there's also a lot of evidence of what people call physician-induced demand, that if you're in a community where there are a lot of physicians, then physicians have more time to do more things that may or may not be the most optimally beneficial things for the population. Not like physicians are trying to do anything bad, but on the margin, there are any number of procedures where watching and waiting might be just as good as immediately jumping in and doing a procedure. So I mentioned, you know, why do people, why do physicians select specialization versus primary care? Well, a lot of research has pointed to um, primary care physicians earning less than specialists and surveys, um, analyses of data, a lot of different approaches of looking at the data and looking at this problem 
have pointed to um, the er differential in earnings being a factor. Medical school is really expensive. Most other countries in the world subsidize it heavily. Um, but medical physicians in the United States graduate with a lot of debt. And um, even those who really initially want to go into primary care um, often find when they look at their debt that it's just not affordable to them. Um, that primary care pays a lot less, pediatrics pays less. Um, in fact, the pediatric subspecialists who do even more training than most residents in medicine um, end up earning not a whole lot more than a general pediatrician. So the pediatric subspecialists like pediatric neurology have terrible shortages because for the amount of education a person goes through, the pay really just is not there. And you know, we, we do believe and we know that many physicians are not in it for the money, but when you graduate with two or $300,000 of student debt um, on top of whatever your undergraduate debt was, this is pertinent and we can't ignore it as an issue. Um, these earnings are so different. Um, a lot of it gets pointed to Medicare where physicians are reimbursed essentially kind of fees based on how, uh, on the relative values of each service that they provide. And in general, the process of updating these payment levels favors giving larger increases to procedures, which means we get more procedures. Um, the increases tend to be smaller for um, evaluation type appointments or general patient management appointments. Um, most private insurers largely follow the Medicare payment structure, so that really creates a bias towards higher payments for procedures, and thus we tend to get more people um, going into procedural fields. And so the incentives um, just kind of point in that direction. So we did some work. Um, this was work that I did with Janet Kaufman, who's at UCSF with me. And we looked at the supply and demand for primary care clinicians in California. Pre-pandemic, we did the study and we were projecting what the um, supply and demand for primary care providers would be in 2025 and 2030. So we used um, fairly simple models to estimate demand. It was essentially kind of straight line projecting off of our current use of physician services. And the blue lines are the 2025 demand on the left and the 2030 demand on the right. Now the supply lines, um, we, we had different projections of kind of the worst case scenarios and the best, most optimistic scenarios. So here I'm giving you kind of the middle scenario that I think is the most plausible and then kind of the rosiest scenario. I want you to notice in both of these that physicians are the um, darkest color in those bars, and there is nowhere near enough physicians coming through the pipeline in primary care to meet demand. The next darkest color is nurse practitioners, and then the lightest color is physician assistants. If we add them in, even in the rosiest scenario, by 2025, we were not projected to have enough but by 2030, we were projected to have enough if you allow and support nurse practitioners and physician assistants working optimally and to the highest level that they are capable. Um, in fact, in general, we're really dependent on nurse practitioners and PAs being able to work to the maximum extent of their knowledge in order to meet our primary care needs into the future. Um, but if we don't have that rosiest scenario, we have a shortage even with our NPs and PAs doing their best work. Regional variations are also really substantial. So um, we used um, various regions to look at what the numbers would show us. And we suggested, um, I'll focus on the 2030 gap on the rightmost column, that the Southern border region of California um, had among the highest shortages, the Central Valley and Central Coast had the highest projected shortages and um, other areas like the San Francisco Bay Area actually looked comparatively good um, relative to the rest of the state. So there's a lot of variation. The Central Valley is, is where I grew up and that area is, it seems to perpetually be the land of health workforce shortages. And so we need to think about in our policies of how to address those regional differences and really encourage providers to go work in the Central Valley, go live there. It's a wonderful place to live. There are a lot of great, tight, wonderful communities that have a lot to offer and trying to get clinicians to move there has been a challenge. We also, Janet and I did some work looking at psychiatrists and this is really depressing. Um, so the um, 
let's see, the, the colors here are all somewhat different. So the um, light blue lines are if we just did a projection about what the future demand would be at the current use of behavioral health services. And then the um, dark blue line is if we also considered the amount of unmet need for psychiatric care. And then the yellow is the projected supply. And by um, 2028, holy moly, I mean, we are gonna be so far short of our projected need for psychiatrists. It's, um, I mean, it's less than half of what the, um, what the projections are. Um, now, psychiatric mental health nurse practitioners can help fill that gap because, gap because they can prescribe and they are educated to provide therapy and many, many of the services that would be needed here. Um, but they are still relatively small in numbers um, nationwide. And they are also somewhat restricted in their scope of practice, although that is changing in California. And then this is looking at um, therapists, um, so non-prescribing therapists, psychologists, um, ma marriage and family therapists, um, psychology counselors, and clinical social workers. And it's a pretty similar story. The supply just really does not appear to be growing at the rate that we need to meet our current population utilization patterns. And if we were trying to meet the unmet need for therapy, we would be even more short. Let's see, I'm gonna move along to talk a little bit about shortages in the nursing workforce. So nursing is, um, I think, really interesting because there's been a lot of data and research on this. Really since World War II, there have been cycles of nursing shortages and they've been studied by policymakers and economists. The first economist who studied this, um, it was his dissertation that he finished in 1970. So, you know, for a relatively recent history, um, there was a shortage that was around um, kind of the turn of 1990. Um, and then we went through a period of time where there was discussions that we had a surplus. And during that 1993 to 97 period, a lot of nursing schools actually closed nationwide and in California. We then went into a shortage that went on for a full decade. Um, it was possibly the longest and deepest one that we experienced both in California and nationally. And then as the financial crisis hit and we went into a recession, we started hearing that there was a surplus of nurses and the data got really unclear about whether or not we had a shortage in the 2014 to 2019 period. And then who knows what's going on now? I'll talk about that in a minute. So pre-pandemic, we've been doing projections of supply and demand for the Board of Registered Nursing for about 15 years now. And these were recent projections that we published of um, pre-pandemic of supply and demand through 2035. And the um, green line is a supply forecast. And the blue lines are different ways that you might project demand. And overall, you can see that we're looking pretty good. That top line I want to note is if, the, if California really tried to increase its numbers of nurses per capita, to a much higher level than where we have ever historically been. And we're even aiming towards that very optimistic type of a target, or we were before the pandemic. But regional differences are important. I wanna note that for the Central Valley and Sierra region, that there was projected to be a shortfall. Um, whereas in other regions of California, like the San Francisco Bay Area, we found that there were projections of a surplus. So these regional differences were huge pre-pandemic. Now, I always get asked, really, was there not a statewide nursing shortage before the pandemic? And I want to go into this a little bit more. We've been surveying nurses. Um, we were surveying them with the last one being in late 2018, and it finished up in early 2019. We would have put another one in the field in 2020, but all of the chief nursing officers were kind of busy doing other things in 2020, so we have not surveyed them since. It seems like every time we gear up to do a survey, there's another variant and the chief nursing officers ask us to please not ask them to fill out a survey. But um, pre-pandemic, these red lines indicate um, when the managers and the chief nursing officers were telling us that it was very difficult to fill open positions. The green is that they were saying it was moderately difficult to fill positions. And then the bars to the rightmost, where I'm sorry, the legend got cut off in this slide, but the bars in the rightmost area were an indication that there was actually a surplus from the chief nursing officer's perspective. So notice that 2010 through around 2013, um, you know, about half or nearly half at least of chief nursing officers said 
that they perceived that there was a surplus of nurses. Now, this was during the recession and the financial crisis, but then it really shifted. By the time you get to 2015, um, the vast majority of chief, chief nursing officers are telling us that there is a shortage of at least a moderate level in their region. But these vary a lot regionally, and these are differences across those regions for nurses with experience. In 2013, we started asking, what, is, what do you perceive is the situation for nurses with experience as a separate category from new graduates? So for nurses with experience, they were reporting really severe shortage. Um, a five would be the most severe shortage and a four would be pretty severe. A three would be, you know, kind of balanced labor market. And you can see the San Francisco Bay Area was the closest to a balanced labor market. And the rest of the state was basically um, saying for experienced nurses, this is bad. We're in bad shape. But what about new graduates? Well, what we were hearing from um, chief nursing officers in every region except for the Central Valley, they perceived there was a glut of new graduates. Now, this is a bit of a mismatch. Um, I understand that what they were experiencing is experienced nurses were retiring and they wanted to hire another experienced nurse to fill that role in the operating room or labor and delivery or somewhere else. But there's only so many experienced nurses to go around and hospitals are essentially all poaching from each other to get their experienced nurses from each other while new graduates were languishing on the job market and they were perceived to be a surplus. So this was a, a mismatch and an issue and a challenge that nursing leaders were really beginning to discuss and try to tackle um, prior to the pandemic. So what's happened since? Um, I'll begin with some national data. This is work from Peter Buerhaus, who's at Montana State University. He's a national expert on nursing workforce. And this is with his colleagues, David Auerbach and Doug Steger. And um, these show the total monthly employment in the nursing workforce in different healthcare sectors. And, these are all relative to February 2020, um, and they go all the way through June 2021. So you can see in the early months of the pandemic, this significant huge drop in employment in pretty much every sector. Um, you had hospitals and physician offices. Um, physician offices took the biggest hit because so much ambulatory care closed and was trying to switch to telehealth. And so if you don't have patients coming to the clinic, you don't need nurses in the clinic. We also saw these big drops in other kinds of outpatient care centers like ambulatory surgery centers, as well as home health care. Um, hospitals even had a dip, but most of these areas have recovered, getting pretty close to the degree of recovery to where the um, that 0% line is of February, 2020. Physician offices are nearly there. Hospitals are still remaining under home health even less than that. But man, look at nursing homes. Employment in nursing homes relative to February, 2020 has just continued to drop like a rock. And, um, and it's now about 12 or 13% below. You know, I hate to be really morbid, but when you look at the death numbers of nursing home residents, um, it's 10 to 15% of nursing home residents died. So I think a lot of this permanent drop and continuing drop in employment in nursing homes is from a loss of residents. And even discounting that, um, we know that a lot of families have avoided moving their family members into nursing homes, even if that care might've been beneficial because of concerns about the pandemic. So nursing home occupancy is way down compared to it where it used to be. And that also means then that employment is down. Um, on the next slide, we can look at the um, full-time employment um, for RNs versus licensed practical nurses and vocational nurses versus AIDS. And um, AIDS have really taken the biggest hit, which, ma which makes sense. And licensed vocational nurses, those are the two groups that mostly work in the nursing homes. This shows the wage increases. And for all of the noise about um, traveling nurses and how much money registered nurses are earning, we don't actually see a lot of action in wages over the, over the pandemic. And this shows the different employment sectors in more detail, but I'm gonna skip forward because I wanna get to some of the other stuff we have. 
Um, these are some California specific data from a survey um, that went out in late 2020. So overall, the percentage of California nurses who reported that they were employed in nursing in late 2020 didn't budge a whole lot. But if we break it down um, by age group, I want you to notice the older age groups of nurses. Employment rates for the older age groups of nurses decreased notably between 2018 and 2020. And when we looked at the open-ended comments that people put in the survey, it was often things like, to the extent, along the lines of, I'm older, I view myself as having significant risk from COVID, so I've retired, I'm out, I'm done, I'm not working. Um, and so we, we really see in the comments a lot of people who are older stepping out and retiring early. If we look at the hours usually worked per week, we also saw a decrease there in the hours worked um, on average per week. And that was particularly notable. There it is for the average overall went down about 10%. And um, the percent working part-time increased quite notably. And then the average hours in nursing homes was about the only setting that didn't decrease. Um, this shows you the percent who plan to retire or leave nursing in the next two years. And you can see that, um, so the lighter shaded bars are from 2018 and the darker shaded of the same color are from 2020. So for nurses 55 to 64 years old, there was more than a doubling of the percentage that say they plan to retire or leave nursing in the next two years. So we anticipate a precipitous loss of older nurses um, pretty rapidly um, to be hitting any day now if it isn't already hitting. Um, I want to note that the number of enrollment spaces available has dropped due to the pandemic. Um, total enrollments decreased with the biggest decreases, almost all the decreases coming from associate degree programs and public programs. Private schools and um, graduate and bachelor's programs have held fairly well, but the associate degree programs, which um, have a lot of geographic diversity, and the public programs, um, which would be the community colleges and Cal State dominantly, were where the losses were. Now, fortunately, our nursing educators do project that enrollments will recover into the future. So this is, we hope, a short-term problem. And we have seen from surveys that the Hospital Association of Southern California does on turnover and vacancies um, that turnover has increased in the pandemic between 2019 and 2020 in general um, for new grad for um, let's see new graduates and general um, staff. That'd be the top one is kind of all nursing staff, and then the bottom one is giving you the tenure view. Um, and vacancy rates are up. And so the bottom chart gives you the 10 year view and the top year chart is quarter by quarter. So what does this all mean for the future? Well, it means that our projections of nursing supply are um, the most updated ones that we have, new ones coming soon, is the blue line. And then the dashed green line is what we projected in the prior pre-pandemic projections. And you can see this dip on the left that's much lower than what the prior projections were. And those are our precipitous retirements and quits. Um, of people leaving the workforce. Um, if we compare the demand to supply, we then project that we have a notable shortage that's gonna go on for at least five years, um, but should balance out um, as we get a little bit past 2025, 2026. Now I need to update these because when we did these projections, we all thought that, um, I mean, that might've been, when was it last fall? And we thought the Delta wave might be it. It's the pandemic that never ends at this point. Um, so we really don't know if schools have been able to recover and we don't know how much nurses have actually been quitting and whether those quits are moving down to younger age groups. So if we think about the implication, well, let's see, I, this really summarizes what I've already said about um, what's happening with the nursing labor market in California. So let's talk about solutions and then get to your questions. There are a lot of policy strategies that are cross-cutting um, across different industries and, and health occupations. There is a need to target education growth into the areas with the greatest shortages. And I wanna point out as an example of problems in this that like the nursing, nursing faculty vacancy rate um, prior to the pandemic was 8% and it's gone up. 
Um, and we know that nursing faculty on average are older than the average nurse. And so there are a lot of retirements coming in for nursing faculty. And we've seen very similar data for other allied health professions. Um, there's a need for employers to partner for health professions education. And there are a lot of ways that employers and education systems can collaborate. They can offer courses and programs in the occupations and the geographic regions with the greatest shortage. They can expand their partnerships in all kinds of care settings. They really um, can do more to recruit students in um, underserved areas. And this is where the losses of slots in the community colleges really worry me from, a, from a access in rural communities and underserved communities perspective. We can also look for opportunities for distance learning. Um, I'll point out New Mexico as a state does a fabulous job with this. And um, Bakersfield College was one of California's leaders in distance learning for registered nursing education about a decade ago. Um, they put, they established, a, actually it was almost two decades ago, they established a really innovative program for distance learning for nursing. Um, and we need to include employers in the education program content discussions to make sure that new graduates are the people they want to hire so that employers aren't telling us that there's a glut of new graduates, but they can't find experienced nurses. Now, employers need have a lot of work to do too. They need to be proactive in supporting the needs of their healthcare workers. They need to encourage their staff to address burnout and stress and everything that they've been through with the pandemic. And everything that they've been through is not just in the workplace. Um, they have faced uncertainty with childcare, uncertainty with schools being open or closed, um, uncertainty about their own family situations, perhaps people with disabilities or older people in their family who have rising care needs. Um, employers need to address that. And the way to address that is not just to give them a self-help mental health app. It's really got to be a dedicated focus on broad support and flexibility for workers. And, um, you know, even just small things like actively encouraging people to take their vacations and not just saying, oh, good, go take your vacation. You should, but reaching out to staff and saying, you really do need to take that vacation. I want you to, and I have arranged for somebody to cover so you can go for two weeks when your kid's graduating from college or whatever it is that's appropriate for them. Um, it's not just offering it, it's really encouraging and welcoming and modeling that it is good to take vacation because many people in the healthcare occupations um, just keep working. And of course, many don't even have vacation or sick leave benefits. So those are important for people who are working in direct care jobs. We need to support new graduate hiring and education. Employers do have a responsibility in this as well. And they um, really, it's less expensive to hire a new graduate and train them up than to pay travelers month over month over month um, or to have a shortage. And um, employers can also provide clinical faculty to help with the education enterprise. But wait, I've got more for employers to do. Um, they can invite faculty to sit on their practice committee so their faculty understand better what employers need. They can offer flexible scheduling for their employees to pursue education and invest formally in transition to practice programs to help new hires rapidly onboard and feel confident in their skills. And they also need to plan to retain staff to the in roles that are appropriate as they are approaching retirement. Perhaps there are flexible opportunities to contribute in healthcare delivery or in education and mentoring that would be valuable to keep people in the workforce as we go through a transition phase of retirements and new hires. Um, state leaders, of course, I'm not gonna let policymakers off the hook. We really have to maintain our education capacity. Community colleges have struggled to maintain their capacity and pivot to online learning during the pandemic, and they clearly need more help. Um, they are necessary for targeting growth in shortage regions, as are the Cal State system. Um, and we, we just need to not let employment enrollments continue to drop. Um, and we may need to shift across different educational programs or geographies to really make this happen. Um, we need to continue to support scholarship programs. And there actually is a lot of endeavor right now in the state to expand scholarship programs across a wide range of healthcare workers. So I really applaud the administration for doing that. And we need to support non-traditional clinical placement settings and the use of simulation education to help spread our thin, thin resources more widely. And finally, we uh, let's not finally yet, we need to support distance learning. And I already have talked about public colleges. 
Now I'll quickly talk about the Future Health Workforce Commission because that that group developed a strategic plan for building the workforce um, aiming at 2030. Their report was published, if I remember correctly, it was around 2018 or 2019. I think it was early 2019. And um, they really were seeking commitments for effective plan implementation and wanted to build and leverage relevant public and private efforts that were already underway or could be underway. So this was a privately funded commission. It was funded by five different major foundations in California, um, but did have the ear of the administration as, um, as the commission was doing its work. So these are the prioritized recommendations. Um, number one was expanding and scaling pipeline programs from middle school through graduate school to recruit and prepare students from underrepresented and low income backgrounds for health careers. Um, and there are there were some model programs. If you want to read the full report or even the abridged versions of the report, there are model programs that they point to and, and some really great opportunities to help facilitate people entering health occupations and increasing diversity. Um, there is a number two was to recruit and support college students from underrepresented regions and backgrounds to pursue health careers. So you get the pipeline going for the largely K through 12, um, middle school and high school being your real target populations. And then you have to actually support them when they go to college. Um, and you need to support scholarships for qualified students to pursue priority health professions and really serve in underserved communities. So these could be scholarships and loan repayments, but the commission really wanted to include scholarships as a priority area because loan repayments rely on a person getting a loan to begin with whereas a scholarship is a lower barrier for somebody who might be worried about taking on debt. Another batch of recommendations included expanding the PRIME program, which is a program across the UC campuses to increase diversity and primary care in medicine. Um, they wanted to expand the number of primary care physician residency positions by 20% and recommended that we intentionally recruit and train students from rural areas to practice in community health centers in their home regions. And then we really focus on identifying learners and students from regions where they would want to return um, to have their careers. And then we wanted to maximize the role of nurse practitioners, which I've already discussed as being essential to meeting primary care needs. There's a need to establish and scale um, more consistent jobs and career opportunities for people in home care type jobs home health aides, nursing assistants, personal care aides. These jobs actually have very confusing regulations and um, training requirements that are not consistent and really make it difficult for people in these occupations to enhance their skills and develop professionally. Um, there was a recommendation to develop a psychiatric nurse practitioner program to recruit and train providers to serve in underserved communities. And then finally, um, scale the engagement of community health workers, promotoras, and peer providers to help amplify the work that's being done by licensed clinicians. Um, the community health workers, promotoras, and peer providers can provide a lot of services and support to the population. And there's a lot of research demonstrating their importance and their benefits to um, healthcare delivery. So I'm going to stop there with those recommendations, and I would love to hear what questions people might have. First of all, thank you for so much data, and why don't you take a breath and a sip of water? I'll give you a chance to do that before I, before I throw out the first question, because that was a lot of information. Um, thinking about um, our, our position as, as kind of consumers and, and public and, and people experienced with healthcare workforce, this is a little bit off topic. But looking at the whole of the healthcare workforce, and this is, a, this is about your advice and recommendations based on the evidence, of course. Um, is healthcare still a good career? Is it a recommended career um, for you know, pay, stability, growth, et cetera? And for people, you know, advising their kids or their grandkids or their friends or their neighbors or even making their own decision, what are some of the considerations that you would make if you were considering um, a career in healthcare? Ooh, it's a great question. You know, overall, healthcare is a great overall field, 
But of course, there are so many different occupations and each occupation has its own benefits and risks. Um, you know, and, and they all have their different strengths and weaknesses and, and issues. Um, you know, I think a lot of the direct care jobs can be extremely um, unsatisfying for people. I think a lot of people who are working in nursing homes or working directly in homes with people with disabilities love the work. And honestly, right now, for the low pay they get and the low levels of respect they get from our society, they have to love those jobs because nobody is, would be going into it for the money. You have a better career path at in and out Burger, quite frankly, than you do in long-term care and home care right now. So I think that is an area where it's very, it's very difficult to encourage a young person to strive to a career in long-term care. And I think it's very, very important that we change that. Um, and that, that we recognize that jobs in that field have incredible social value and that we ensure that they're compensated for the value that they provide to our families and our loved ones. Um, you know, and I think we can also emphasize that, that long-term care, you know, we might say broadly, those are bad jobs, but it can also be a foot in the door. It can be a foot in the door to learn about what you like as a worker and what you don't like. It can be a foot in the door to pursue additional education. So, you know, I, I, I'd be cautious about some of the occupations, but I wouldn't be fully negative. I, I think a person um, can find some great opportunities um, if, if they are supported well. Um, I also find, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, it can be really challenging to recommend medicine um, as a field. There's a huge amount of debt. It's incredibly competitive to get in. I, I personally know people who've applied three and four cycles um, and then still don't get in. And just the application process can be extremely expensive. The debt that people take on is great. And um, the workload and the stress can be quite high. So I would encourage anybody thinking about a healthcare career to not assume that that means that they should be a doctor, but to actually um, take some time and learn about occupational therapy, radiation technologists, nursing, um, physical therapy, learn about all the different occupations um, because like, there's something that they all have to offer in different ways. And there is so much of a culture of, well, then you should go into medicine. Obviously you wanna to go to medical school where there are these, all these other occupations that um, some of which pay extremely well, a lot of which have attributes that are different than medicine that an individual might find more attractive. And at the same time, I think we need to recognize that to get more primary care providers, we need to make those jobs better and, and really support people who are going into medicine more effectively. Great, uh, a couple of questions now uh, that we'll go through. So um, one is, it, um, what portion of our healthcare workforce were and are visiting from other countries? And did COVID travel restrictions up in that sector of the workforce in general? You know, what to what extent do we rely on healthcare workers from outside the country and how did that change during the pandemic? That's a great question. Yeah, the data that I pr um, provided, and I'm trying to scroll back to find it was um, only about the percent of the health workforce that um, was not born as a US citizen, which is about 16%. And, um, you know, there, there's a mix of people in there. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of international medical graduates that go to medical schools in other countries and then um, come to the United States for their residency typically. Um, and then um, many immigrate or stay after their residency in um, visa categories that are more accessible if they work in health profession shortage areas. Um, there are, of course, a lot of nurses that have immigrated over the decades. And so that's a significant portion of our workforce. But yeah, when we look at the international recruitment and in the more recent- So what happened during the pandemic? Yeah, during the pandemic, I mean, those numbers were actually dropping before the pandemic. Um, some of the immigration restrictions that were being established by the Trump administration were affecting um, some of the international medical graduates and international nurses right off the bat. Um, international medical graduates from Pakistan, for example, were finding it very challenging to get a visa. And um, the pandemic just locked a lot of that down. Um, you know, we, we just I mean, nobody's wanted to immigrate. And even, even people who are working cross-border jobs in, say, the border cities of Texas and California, who are you know, legal residents and legal employees of California, if they had family in Mexico or they had family in Canada, 
they didn't necessarily want to be stuck on the other side of a border lockdown from their family. So there has been less of that fluidity across our borders, um, even in our fully documented workforce than, um, you know, than I think anybody expected. And that really has caused, I think, problems, especially for the long-term care workforce, where there's a higher proportion of immigrants than the other job sectors. Great. So here's another question. Uh, your opinion on having graduates from medical school complete one year of social service in needed communities before entering a residency program, uh, this would be a, a fully paid community service year. Uh, other countries have that concept in place. Yeah, I think that um, can be a great idea. I think the, the, um, I think the concern that some people might express is that it would be a shame if um, the underserved communities essentially had a rotating cast of rookie doctors and that somehow was viewed as a replacement for a more permanent recruitment. Um, but at the same time, having, um, having services is important. And, um, you know, and, and that can be a mechanism by which to expose clinicians to um, some of the joy and some of the benefits of working with underserved communities. It may be that some of those experiences are better placed halfway through medical school rather than before residency um, to help shape a person's planning before they apply to residency programs. Um, you know, maybe a person has that experience in their second year of medical school or third year of medical school and decides that they want to apply to a residency in a community health center in an underserved area. Um, or they you know, want to intentionally um, sign up to do residency with Indian Health Services and, or something like that. And so you know, I think the timing of that service component is really important. But I do think the concept, um, especially if we, if we did it in a way to really help inspire people to permanently work in underserved communities would be great. So related to that question is, you know, you mentioned a lot about regional shortages um, across the, and we saw the map across the country. How do we get the healthcare workers to the places where they're needed? Um, you know, some countries, uh, that's a stipulation of having your medical school paid for is that you're going to be assigned to a certain area or something, which we don't have. So how do we, how do we deal with these regional shortages? Yeah, we've got a number of tools that we, we know work pretty well. Um, loan repayment programs for health professional shortage areas seem to, work, seem to help a lot. Um, there may not be enough repayment happening. Maybe those repayments need to be bigger in order to attract more people into the shortage areas. Um, you know, we also have seen a lot of um, a lot of growth of the workforce in rural communities and health professional shortage areas have been coming from nurse practitioners and from other occupations um, that, that help to complement the workforce or can play a lot of the same role that say physicians can play. Um, or you might see some substitution between registered nurses and licensed vocational nurses in some communities. And that's not necessarily bad. I mean, the reality is that if you look at the data, for example, on nurse practitioners, um, the data show that um, patients are equally or more satisfied with the care they get from nurse practitioners and the quality of care um, based on numerous, very rigorous research studies shows that the quality of care is really equivalent um, in the area in which the nurse practitioner is educated and prepared. And just like any other clinician, um, nurse practitioners are educated to refer patients out when they hit a case where they're like, huh, I don't know what to do with this, um, or this is outside my knowledge base. Um, so certainly a primary care physician by nature of medical education and residency has more knowledge and maybe is referring out less often, but um, nurse practitioners do a great job. And so I, I do think we need to keep our eyes on those workforces and um, really avoid the language of any particular occupation being lesser than any other. They also have strengths and, and deficits. They all have um, roles to play. And, um, and there also is a certain amount of all hands on deck that we need to do. Um, and so I, I, and, and I think some of the occupations and strategies that leverage, um, that leverage occupations that don't require as much formal education is another pathway to get people into underserved areas. Because the more, you know, it, 
to just throw out a stereotype, you go to medical school, probably in an urban area, and then you do your residency, probably in an urban area. And at that point, you're in your late twenties. So that may be the stage in your life where you actually also meet a life partner. And now your life partner also has been living in an urban area. It gets really hard to recruit that couple into a rural community, um, which is a very different story than the one I heard from a physician from Colorado um, who talked about a rural clinic. And the physician in that rural clinic was um, wanting to retire, but he'd been trying to recruit somebody to come in on a loan repayment program, could not find a physician. But he um, also realized that Colorado has very broad practice authority for nurse practitioners. They don't have to have formal physician supervision there after um, six months of mentorship. And there was one registered nurse at the local critical access hospital that he thought was really sharp. And so he went to her and he said, I want to retire and I think you should replace me. I think you should become a nurse practitioner. And he encouraged her and encouraged her. And she went to University of Colorado that had a program that allowed a partial distance learning option for her. So she did her clinicals with this physician in the rural town and then went to Denver for classes that could not be remote and shouldn't be remote. Then she went back and did her six months with this physician supervising her and he handed her the keys to the practice. And I mean, that is a great, I mean, it's a great story. But I've heard that same story from people in Nevada. I've heard the same story from people in New Mexico. I mean, this is a this is a way, especially when you're looking at a rural community losing their only provider, um, having a local person easily access education to be able to continue to meet those needs. Um, I don't think we can underestimate the value of that. And um, and it's probably a better strategy than trying to rely too much on recruiting externally over and over again. Great, great. Lots of solutions there.